Good morning, everyone. I'm Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Welcome to this week's History's Lunch program, which is sponsored by the John and Lucy Shackelford Charitable Fund of the Community Foundation for Mississippi. We're in our home, the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium in the Museum of Mississippi History and Mississippi Civil Rights Museum, and we're streaming live on both Facebook and YouTube, where those videos are available to watch anytime after. If you've not already done so, please silence your cell phone. I note with sadness the death of our friend Martha Swain, a scholar on women and politics in Mississippi, mentor to a legion of students and colleagues over the course of her storied career, past president of the Mississippi Historical Society, the author of several books, and co-editor with Elizabeth Payne of the two-volume collection, Mississippi Women, Their Histories, Their Lives, about which she spoke to us in 2010 for History's Lunch. I hope you'll mark your calendars for the afternoon of Saturday, June 17th, when we'll have a special screening of The Crisis, the oldest surviving feature film to have been shot in Mississippi, released in 1916 and based on the novel by Winston Churchill, not that Winston Churchill. <laughs> the silent film tells the story of the Civil War and the struggle to end slavery. A new score has been commissioned for the silent film, and an orchestra will actually perform it live here in the auditorium. So. Come be with us on the 17th of next month for that. Tomorrow, June 1st, at 5 p.m., we'll have our next installment of History Happy Hour, which is sponsored by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Mississippi. There'll be live entertainment, free refreshments, and a cash bar. Guests can also join interactive flash tours throughout the museums. That'll be here tomorrow evening. This is Home, Medgar Evers, Mississippi, and the Movement, also opens upstairs tomorrow, Thursday, June, 5th, uh, June 1st. The exhibit marks the 60th anniversary of the assassination of Medgar Evers and covers his early life and family, his career with the NAACP, and his lasting legacy. Next week's History is Lunch will be held in conjunction with those commemorations, and uh, the Evers' daughter, Rena Evers Everett, and former Evers fellows Dion Bailey, Bobby Smith, and Pamela Walker will be with us to present the Evers Archive, Voices, Justice, Legacies. Today, we are delighted to welcome back our friends Carolyn Brown and Carla Wall to discuss their new book, To Dance, To Live, a biography of Thalia Mara. Carolyn J. Brown is a writer, editor, and independent scholar. She earned her BA in English and History from Duke University and her MA and PhD in English, both from the University of North Carolina, Greensboro. Brown has taught at St. Andrew's Episcopal School since 2017, and before that, taught at Elon University, Millsaps College, and UNC Greensboro. She is author of The Artist's Sketch, a biography of painter Kate Freeman Clark, the award-winning biographies A Daring Life, a biography of Eudora Welty, and Song of My Life, a biography of Margaret Walker, and is co-editor of A DeGrummond Primer, Highlights of the Children's Literature Collection. You're five for five on the books. You've done a history as lunch on every one of them. We love that. Carla Wall is a consultant in communications and public relations from Jackson. She has served on boards for theater, visual arts, ballet, and community organizations. Wall edited Art to Life, Welty and Theater by art historian Patty Carr Black. We'll hear first from Carolyn Brown and then Carla Wall. <laughs> You do. And I didn't. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. I'm happy to be here and to be back in Jackson amongst good friends. This book truly is a collaboration, and I received assistance from three women without whom I could not have written the book. The first two are Leanne Mahoney. Thalia Mara's niece, who created the first and only website dedicated to Mara and was able to answer many of my questions, and Mona Nicholas, director of the USA IBC. However, the third person, the one who is most responsible for making this biography happen and is my most important partner on this project is Carla Wall. Carla was one of Thalia's closest friends and the caretaker of most of the archival material found in the book. 
It was her commitment to telling Thalia's story that brought this book to publication in time for the 2023 IBC. I want to car invite Carla up to the podium now and have her read her short reflection on Mara that is included in the opening pages of the book. Thank you. Good job, Amy. As someone who has always been an avid supporter of the arts and actively engaged in community and state organizations, I recognized a kindred spirit when I met Thalia Mara. It was also intriguing to me that at the age of 65, when most people are retiring or certainly thinking about it, she would move across the country to a place where she knew no one to start a whole new chapter in her life. Over the next 28 years, we would work together on art and community projects. I grew to respect and admire her passion and discipline and the impact that she was making. A gifted dancer, teacher, and a visionary, she was also a creative thinker who demanded excellence in all that she did. She was passionate, sometimes fiery, and tireless in her work. She could outlast those far younger <laughs> than she was. When you worked with Thalia, you had to buckle up. And so, that <laughs> indeed, um, she was, but fortunately for us, she was also warm, funny, compassionate, a good listener, and a woman of faith. As a result, she had an extraordinary an extraordinary ability to get others to see her vision and to go out and to help making it a reality. She believed the arts were for everyone and could change, and the arts were for everyone and could strengthen and change a community. And I think certainly, as the book reveals, she was absolutely right about that. Her, it, as this book, it, she, her impact on the arts and on Jackson and the, un, uh, and the entire state were unparalleled. On reflection, I see now, though, Thalia Moore as a role model for living a full and a productive life. She didn't dwell in the past. She lived in the present, but she always had an eye on the future. And she remained connected to people and to ideas to the very end of her life, giving generously of her time and talent. Her passion for life gave her a vibrancy that remains with us and inspires us even today. It has been a pleasure to see this book come to fruition and to work on this with Carolyn, uh, to share Thalia's incredible story, I think she would be pleased, probably a little bit amazed, but I think she would be pleased. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. Carla has also been the caretaker of this spectacular portrait of Thalia that graces our cover. The painting, created by artist Enrique Dorda in 1938, depicts Mara in the ballet Romance. Dorda was the last of the court painters of Spain. He did this pastel portrait of Thalia after he had left the Spanish court, immigrated to America, and settled in Greenwich Village in New York City, where they were neighbors. As we go through Thalia Mara's life story, it is important to know that Mara was originally known as Elizabeth Simmons. Thalia Mara is her stage name. For simplicity's sake, I will simply refer to her as Thalia, or by her last name, Mara. Thalia was born to Russian immigrant parents in Chicago on June 28, 1911. Her mother, pictured left, was Lydia Nemenshinka, 
who immigrated from St. Petersburg in the early years of the 20th century. Lydia's father was in the publishing business and found himself on the wrong side of politics at the turn of the century. To protect his children, he sent Lydia and her brother first to London to stay with relatives. They later came to the U.S. and made Chicago their home. Lydia met and married Louis Semyonov in Chicago. They were more commonly known as Simon or Simmons. Lewis was in the haberdashery business and Lydia went to work as a seamstress. She had Thalia at the young age of 18. According to Thalia's niece, Leanne Mahoney, in Lydia's opinion, Thalia inherited the best of both of her parents, her father's loving manner and her mother's drive. Because she was working full time, Lydia had to find activities for her daughter after school. She signed, up for, she signed her up for piano lessons as well as dance lessons with a friend. Thalia showed an early enthusiasm for dance and performing, as you can see here. She already is on her toes displaying her talent. On weekends, Thalia's mother would take her daughter out in Chicago to experience all the cultural attractions the city had to offer, including ballet. I found both of these items amongst Mara's papers, and so I'm fairly certain Lydia and Thalia saw the great Anna Pavlova perform at the Medina Temple Theater on February 28, 1921, where Pavlova danced her signature piece, The Dying Swan. The cover image on the program shows Pavlova in her famous swan costume, and legend has it that on her deathbed she even reportedly cried, prepare my swan costume. <laughs> it is difficult today, I think, to understand the popularity of Pavlova at this time. In my opinion, seeing Pavlova dance was the moment that changed Thalia Mara's life. She was nine years old and completely enthralled. Dancing would no longer be an after-school activity for her. At the time Thalia witnessed Anna Pavlova dance, she was dancing in Chicago with a teacher named Miss Butler. Leanne Mahoney, again, from whom we learned a lot of information about Thalia's early years, said, Miss Butler had her troupe performing anywhere she could find an audience, on weekends, two or three shows a day. It was the parent of another girl in the troupe that remarked to Lydia that Thalia had a great deal of natural talent and she deserved a professional teacher. And these are images of Thalia dancing during this time in Miss Butler's group. Lydia found Adolf Baum, a graduate of the Marinsky School in St. Petersburg, to teach her blossoming ballerina. He was Mara's first introduction to the Russian School of Ballet, but not her last. Baum came to Chicago when he was asked to direct a U.S. tour for Serge Diaghilev in 1916. Diaghilev was a very well-known arts impresario, and his ballets were incredible spectacles, from the costumes to the choreography. Baum was injured during the tour in 1917 and decided to remain in the U.S. He moved to Chicago in 1919 and opened his school of dance in 1923. I could not find much firsthand information in Thalia's papers regarding her time with Baum in Chicago, but I did come across the diaries and correspondence of two sisters from Ohio who studied with Baum at the same time that, that Thalia did. Josephine and Hermine Schwartz, Josephine is the taller of the two in these photos, left their archive to Wright State University and it was filled with fabulous letters written home to family about their time in Baum's studio in Chicago. I learned from the sisters' letters about Ravinia, 
which in 1925 was the summer opera capital of the world. It is located right outside of Chicago. And every summer, dancers in Baum's studio were chosen to dance in Ravinia's operatic performances. Josephine, Hermine, and Thalia were all selected to perform, which was quite an honor. What I also learned from several of these letters, though, is that it was not always as lovely for the dancers on stage as it was for the audience. And so I want to read you from a couple of these letters from the Schwartz, Schwartz sisters. Hermine wrote home to her family on one of these performances. Dearest family, last night I souped in Lohengrin and had the first real thrill of my whole life as far as beautiful people and marvelous voices are concerned. Yours truly was a page in back of the king and held his sword and stood until my two feet went to sleep and a lovely mosquito feasted off of my right leg and feasted so long and so hard that there are five bites in a row and they are swollen and turning black and blue from my scratching them. <laughs> and Josephine wrote to her brother, dearest brother, one time it was a hundred in the shade and I and Herm had to dance. It was atrocious. All the girls were wilted, and anything you put in your stomach made you feel goofy, so I hardly ate that day and the next. But the days that are the worst are the sultry, hot, sticky days when the air has so much moisture it cannot hold any more, and your perspiration doesn't dry off at all. Hard work. In 1927, at the age of 16, Baum encouraged Mara to travel to Europe for further study. She traveled alone, first by train from Chicago to New York and then by ship to France. All she had with her was a piece of paper provided by Baum to show to Russian dance teacher Olga Priya Brzezinska, who like Baum was from St. Petersburg and also danced with the Marinsky Theater. She would not be alone long though. Her mother would join her six months later and would stay close to her the rest of their lives. Lydia found them a place to live and a job for herself in haute couture. And in Paris, Thalia's dance education broadened further. From Priya Brzezinska, whom she fondly called Prio, she learned character dance which is integral to much of the classical ballet repertoire. She also learned how to teach dance. She described Prio as a rigid disciplinarian who maintained great authority and commanded absolute attention. However, she also showed infinite compassion and kindness and lavished great attention on those students who were especially receptive, a statement which I believe would accurately describe Mara's teaching later on. During her time in Paris, she danced and traveled with several companies, which is what this slide illustrates. In the top photo, she is in Paris in 1928 on the rooftop of the Gaumont Palace. And in the bottom photo, she's performing on an outdoor stage in Montreux, Switzerland, also from 1928. And on the left, she's with her future husband, Arthur Mahoney. They had met in Paris and both were chosen to travel on a South American tour with the great choreographer, Michel Fakin. In this photo, they are standing in front of a placard announcing their performance in Buenos Aires in 1929. Arthur and Thalia's relationship strengthened during the South American tour. Thalia, or Elizabeth here, gave Arthur this photo of herself in costume and lovingly signed it, For Arthur, Remember, Elizabeth, Buenos Aires, 1929. They also acquired a parrot during this trip <laughs> at a port north of Rio. The parrot, Pipo, 
would live with them for the next 65 years. Yep, loved animals and pets. Arthur and Thalia returned to the U.S. to New York City in 1929 during the beginning of the Great Depression. Work was hard to find and both had to look for ways to support themselves in order to survive. Arthur found a job as a soda jerk and Thalia with the Capitol Theater as a Chester Hale girl. They both also found work as members of the Radio City Music Hall Corps de Ballet. Lydia would even find work there in the costume department. It was also during this time that Thalia Mara officially changed her name. Her niece Leanne said, early on during her search for employment as a dancer, she came to realize that she needed a more exotic name. Lydia was given the task of creating Elizabeth's stage name and chose Thalia for the Greek muse of comedy and Mara, which was derived from a name in Lydia's Russian family. And before I leave this slide, I wanted to tell you a little bit about more about the Chester Hale girls and read you um, from an interview I found that describes one of the, the dances that they did or, and how it worked. Mara stated that there were 16 Chester Hale girls. They danced from daybreak to 11 p.m. seven days a week for $60 per week. They danced four shows a day, except on holidays when they danced five. They danced ballet, jazz, tap, character dancing, and even ballet on roller skates to pay the bills. Mara also recalled one memorable stunt that the girls performed. We had an aggressive promoter it occurred to her that if we could dance in front of the Chrysler Building Spire, it would be a surefire newsreel item. So a 16 by 16 platform was rigged up adjacent to the towering spire. The stage hung over the street, 57 stories up. It had no rails, nothing. When we refused to dance on it, they decided half of us would go out. Of course, it turned out to be my half of the line. And because she was the tiniest, Mara was perched on the end. She later recollected, when I think of it now, my knees still get weak. We each took up a little more than a foot. We had little masks on, so we couldn't even see that well. And it was a windy day in March. <laughs> so we went through our thing with the newsreel cameras grinding away. In the 1930s, Arthur and Thalia would go on tour together in the US and Canada. They performed all styles of dance as depicted here, flamenco, jazz, and even court dances. They were now dancing full time finally, and their dance partnership would become official when the two would marry in 1939. They were at the peak of their popularity in the late 30s and 40s, with publications calling their dancing brilliant, and the New York Times even writing that though it is usually dangerous for anybody but a Spaniard to attempt Spanish dances, Mr. Mahoney and Miss Mara emerged with flying colors. And I love this. They graced the cover of uh, American Dancer magazine in April 1938, and if you can see, it says it was 25 cents a copy. <laughs> this magazine is the predecessor of Dance magazine. Okay. Arthur had found work teaching at the Juilliard School in the 1930s. The two had also taught at the School of Dance Arts at Carnegie Hall and during the summers at Jacob's Pillow, the famous summer dance colony in Massachusetts. During the summer of 1947, the two would be named managing directors at Jacob's Pillow in the absence of the regular director, Ted Sean. It was the only time in the history of the festival that Sean named someone other than himself as directors. But what a summer it was. The couple was featured in a story in Life magazine, 
And Joe Pilates, the founder of Pilates, who's pictured here in the middle, was on the faculty. They were ahead of their time, weren't they, utilizing Pilates. And it's, this is, of course, before Pilates became the popular form of body conditioning that it is today. Here are some more images from Jacob's Pillow. This is the front page of the Life magazine story, and I really love this image because do you see Thalia and Arthur sitting there reading like they're ignoring all the dancing going on around them? And the photo on the right of the couple dancing outside, which is one of Carla and our favorite photos of them, was taken by their friend and famous dance photographer John Lindquist, whose photos are all archived at Harvard. And the Harvard archivist who shared photos with me uh, from the Lindquist collection also found images of Thalia that we had never seen before. They were not amongst Thalia's papers. So these were quite exciting and are included in the book. So. In 1947, Mara and Mahoney opened the School of Ballet Repertory in New York City. They would continue to teach here until 1963 when the money would run out. It was a theme, of course. Money would run out. And they would have to close the school. The school focused on maintaining high standards of dance instruction, and the curriculum was directed to teachers from all over the U.S. who would come to study and gain certification at various levels. So you can see here Thalia and Arthur teaching different classes to ballet teachers. In 1963, though, they would open their second school, the National Academy of Ballet, to much acclaim. Unlike the previous school, this school was an academic ballet school modeled after the great state-supported institutions of the London, Copenhagen, Moscow, and Leningrad ballet companies. Upon graduation, students would be prepared for either college or to become principal dancers in world-class dance companies. And this is a picture of the entrance uh, in its first location in 1963. I interviewed April Berry, who attended the school from 1967 to 1969, and she is now Director of Community Engagement and Education for the Kansas City Ballet. She described her experience at the school to me, and I want you to look at this photo while I read it to you, because I believe it perfectly illustrates what I learned about the school from her account. She told me that Miss Mara was her first professional teacher and that she was completely in awe of her. Mara was extremely demanding and expected excellence from her students. It started with appearance. Barry recalled that even the younger dancers had to wear the same color leotards and ballet slippers, and hair had to be neat and tidy. She added, we all had to wear our hair in two braids that we coiled into two ponytails that crisscrossed in the back. We also had to wear white ribbons. If we did not have the ribbons, we did not dance, and we had to sit against the wall that day. Miss Mara was elegant and stylish. You can see that here. And we were expected to be so too. When I asked her if Miss Mara scared her <laughs> as a young adolescent dancer, Barry said no. I respected her, and everything I learned from her, I still use to this day. And here are some additional images from the National Academy of Ballet from her time there. Um, these images give you a sense of the school, I think. On the left, you see Thalia Mara teaching an academic class. It looks like history, maybe, or geography. And on the other side, at the top, you see students in her apartment. And many, of, many students who came from distant locations actually lived with her until there were dormitories. 
And then at the bottom, you have three of her students performing at the Waldorf Astoria in the lobby. And she always encouraged her students to perform in public places. The National Academy of Theater Arts closed in 1973 due to lack of funding. Mara, now in her 60s and separated from Mahoney, would begin a new chapter in her career and life when she is invited to interview and then offered the position of artistic director at the Jackson Ballet. And this image is the actual newsletter announcing her hiring from July 13th, 1975. Mara quickly recognized when she got to Jackson that she faced a new set of obstacles teaching dance, teaching dance here. And I want to read to you from the book from, again, a couple of interviews I found when she's looking back on her career. She told Sherry Lucas in a 2001 interview that the first part of that first year in Jackson was terrible. She remembered stunned students who didn't understand her professional approach. She said, I had to pin them down. It was hard for them to take. They were used to flying around. They weren't used to getting things from the bottom up. Afterwards, they began to see. And she also told Donnie Snow, I was used to kids who wanted to be dancers, who ate, slept, and lived dance. These kids wanted to be cheerleaders. Mara frequently remarked that she could not accomplish anything in less than five years, but just after a single year, after taking the helm of the Jackson Ballet, she accomplished her first huge success, which was achieving performing member status in the Southeastern Regional Ballet Association. And then two years later, she had her Jackson students performing some of the most difficult ballets there are to perform. So that was by 1977. Mara was still dissatisfied though, despite her successes, with the lack of audience for ballet in Jackson. And she told interviewer Betty Jolly in a 1977 article that she saw firsthand how Jackson was a sports town and she wanted to stimulate a similar interest in ballet. And she says, since the people, particularly the men who would provide the financial support were so sports minded, it occurred to me that the word competition was something they could relate to. I proposed to my board that we bring the international ballet competition to Jackson. I envisioned the competition as part of the Jackson Ballet and its support group, the Guild. And I love this quote that I found from one of the board members when she suggested this idea initially. She says, after the initial shock of the, su of the suggestion, we looked at her with disbelief. <laughs> The competitions had never been held in the Western world, and Thalia was suggesting this colossal artistic undertaking for Jackson, Mississippi, which did not even have a professional dance company at that time. But Mara quickly proved what she, was, what she could do, and so the top photo here, top left, um, was uh, bringing Mikhail Baryshnikov and Peter Martins to Jackson for a um, fundraiser. And then bottom right, I love this photo, is Thalia making her case for bringing the IBC to Jackson. And you've got Mayor Dale Danks there, and then you have it, the first gentleman is Walter Terry, who was on the committee to the site committee looking for a location for the US IBC. She had reached out to members of the search committee, invited them to Jackson, made her case, and as I say, the rest is history. The 12th USA IBC is set to begin on June 10th, 2023. 
And here's images from that first US IBC. It was a huge success. Pictured here are the gold and silver senior medalists and the junior division gold medalists. And then during the second IBC, which happened three years later uh, in 1982, and the IBC just continued to grow every year with the number of dancers participating, the number of countries being represented. And 82 is an especially exciting year because two Americans took home medals, including Jackson's own Kathy Thibodeau. And these are images of her dancing. Uh, one of the great innovations established by Mara was naming a Mississippi artist a poster artist for the USIBC competition each year. Here's some of them from three, four, five, and six. Artists have included Sandy McNeil, Lynn Green Root, Eleanor Graves, Kenneth Humphrey, Andrew Bucci, and Kit Fields, just to name some of them. And here are a few of the famous and favorite dancers who have graced the stage over the years. At the top left are the Chinese dancers from 1982. And some of you might remember that the male dancer defected during the competition. Uh, in the middle, Soviet dancers from, it got cut off there, 1990, 94. 94. And then the Cuban dancer Jose Manuel Carreño from 1990, a fan favorite. Okay. Mara, now in her 80s, I, this is the short version, remember, <laughs> was not done yet. Often described as a petite powerhouse, she established the Thalia Mara Arts International Foundation in the 1990s with the mission of, quote, preserving, nurturing, and advancing the education, understanding, and love of the arts in all its manifestations. It was important to Carla and I that readers understand that Thalia, as much as she loved dance, was a patron of all the arts. And the second half of this mission statement reflects that. She says emphatically that all the arts, performing, visual and design, film and media, literary and language, are of vital importance to the future of civilization. As an example of this mission at work, she created the World Performance Series, which brought extraordinary performers to the state and exposed citizens to the epitome of art during the first season, performers included trumpeter Wynton Marsalis and violinist Joshua Bell, the Aquila Theater of London performing King Lear, the American Ballet Theater performing Don Quixote with Jose Manuel Carreño in the starring role and the Alvin Ailey Dance Company. It was an incredible lineup indeed. On July 30th, 1998, the Mayor's Arts Achievement Honors would recognize these three extraordinary women from Jackson for their achievements in the arts. Eudora Welty and Margaret Walker for literature and Mara for dance and dance education. I treasure this photo taken by Kay Holloway and given a copy given to me by Carla after the publication of Song of My Life having written biographies now on all three women. But it also saddens me to look at it sometimes because it would be Margaret Walker who would die just a few months later from breast cancer. Welty would pass in 2001 and then Mara in 2003. Mara would suffer a series of strokes and died on October 8th at St. Dominic's. Her funeral was held on October 11th at St. Andrew's Episcopal Cathedral. The day before the funeral, her body lay in state at Thalia Mara Hall. Carla organized the viewing and assisted with the funeral. Carla remarked that it seemed appropriate that since most of her life was spent on stage, it should end on stage as well in the building that bears her name. 
The art on the cover of the funeral program that you see here was created by Mara's close friend and artist, Sandy McNeil. And here's an image of her casket leaving the cathedral and being taken to the waiting hearst. You may recognize some of the pallbearers, mayors, and former mayors among them. And I just thought I'd include this image. I think Marshall Ramsey always does a really great job, doesn't he, of remembering people when they pass. And I thought this image of Thalia Mara, his cartoon was perfect. Part of Thalia Mara's legacy and what I believe connects her to, to Welty and Walker more than most people know is that she was quite a writer herself. She left behind 11 instructional books on dance that have been published in other languages and reissued several times over the years. She also had one book that was not instructional and simply a pure celebration of dance, entitled To Dance, To Live, with illustrations by Tina Mackler, of 26 20th century dancers and dance companies. I heard from several people I interviewed that the phrase to dance to live was Mara's mantra. And I thought no phrase would be more fitting as the title for our book. I was obviously aware she had already used it, but was permitted to use it for the biography by adding a biography of Thalia Mara following the colon. This book in particular, I think, connects her directly with Welty and Walker. As one reviewer wrote about it, Mississippi is justly famous for the many distinguished writers born within its borders. It has recently acquired another important writer by adoption, Thalia Mara, artistic director of the Jackson Ballet. Of course, another legacy of Mara's is the Jackson Municipal Auditorium being renamed Thalia Mara Hall in 1994. At the time of the renaming, Mara said she was overwhelmed and that it was a very humbling experience. She also was officially commended by the Mississippi legislature in 1998. Senate Concurrent Resolution 649 states, quote, that we do hereby commend Ms. Thalia Mara for her monumental contributions to education and the arts in Mississippi, for her role in the development of dance, not just in Mississippi, but worldwide, and for her enrichment and revitalization of the entire cultural community of Mississippi. Since our presentation began with a portrait, I thought it fitting we end with one. This portrait by Lynn Greenroot hangs in Thalia Mara Hall and was completed in 1994, the same year as the renaming of the auditorium. With its strong lines and exuberant bold colors, it is very different from the younger, more romantic, classical depiction of Mara by Enrique Dorda. I like this image, Carla and I both like this image a lot because it shows Thalia tying up her ballet shoes and hard at work. And I want to end by just reading to you my final thoughts on her legacy from the book. Mara's contributions to the economic impact of the city and state cannot be overstated. But what Mara would most want to be remembered for is bringing the arts to others here in Mississippi, in New York, and beyond. The greatest testament to her legacy and influence is the plethora of correspondence left behind from former students and collaborators living all over the world, telling her about their latest projects, requesting her assistance with choreography, inviting her to serve on a panel, asking for her advice on an upcoming performance, or simply wishing her a Merry Christmas or a Happy Easter. These letters are personal, warm. They are evidence of a woman whose relationships were lasting and who successfully passed on her passion for dance to others in the US, Europe, Australia, New Zealand, and elsewhere. She was a teacher 
whose influence was felt long after the dance class was over. Well, I do have one final slide, <laughs> and that's the one that in, to encourage everyone to go to the IBC this year. My book's publication was designed to coincide with the US IBC, and being that it was postponed a year due to the pandemic was fortunate for me, <laughs> as it gave me an extra year to complete the book. So we hope you plan to go. Tickets are on sale now, and the book will be featured at the two-week com competition and also available for sale there. So I am done, and Carla and I are happy to answer any questions that you might have. If anyone has a question, you can raise your hand and bring the microphone to you. No questions? Oh, right here. This is not fully a question, but uh, I think it's good for us all to remember that uh, Thalia was involved in all kinds of administrative activities. She was a great organizer for anything that came along, and she was often happy to do it, in fact, most of the time. One of the uh, events, and I don't know whether you happen to address that in the book or not, because your obvious principal concern was with dancing and ballet in general, but uh, she called me on the telephone, I was still in Washington, and she said, uh, David, I'm organizing a uh, uh, program going to run longer than a week called Mississippi Homecoming, mm -hmm. and it's it to bring back <laughs> distinguished Mississippians from around the nation, and, uh, and I wanted to ask you a little question. I said, well, what, what's that there? She said, oh, would you write a play for us? <laughs> and uh, so I said, I'd be happy to, and uh, we talked about it a little bit and decided to focus on the early years of Mississippi history, which is what a lot of the things were and concerned at that event. And I then got Lance Goss from Millsaps to direct the play. And I think it was all, the whole series of activities were, were extremely uh, successful. I don't know what happened to they were. I'll ask you if you happen to touch upon Actually, it. Actually, that's when the award comes down. Uh, I know it was called the Mayor's Arts, Arts Achievements Award, Honors. But it was really part of the homecoming. Day. Right. And, um, and we do mention it in that, the book. That was an amazing thing. I was thinking I could move around. Uh, that it was, you know, it was amazing. And it also speaks to Thalia's boldness. She would just think of something like that and then call you up and say, hello, will you write a play or whatever. <laughs> and it's, it's remarkable how many people will say, uh, yes, I'll help you do that. Yes. Uh, thanks for the great presentation. Uh, my recollection was that when the first IBC came, the person they, that did the most fundraising was Billy Munger, which is not always the first name you think about when you think about ballet. Um, and I was always, I, I wondered if Ms. Marr had any, any role in getting him in, involved in that, because I think they were very successful. Oh, they were wildly successful. That's the guy you would want yeah, not to at raise the very money beginning. for you. Billy comes a little bit later in that process. Um, I, I'm trying to think of what year Billy comes in there, and let me say, he, he was amazing and certainly got the IBC in that regard to, to move forward. However, I do not want y'all to not know that Thalia was an amazing fundraiser, too. I don't know if it's because she'd go into these heads of companies or she would go in like this, and she would, I don't know if they just didn't want to tell this little lady they weren't going to help her, or, you know, it's kind of like being called to the principal's office or something, but, but she did. But the first years were a little, uh, you know, they were harder. It was kind of hand to mouth, as, as we say. And Warren Ludlam was very involved in that early on, too. Uh, who, of course, and then Billy comes on, and he would then be chairman of the board for many years, and 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 certainly was great with that, and, as well as a really good supporter of ballet. Yeah, I mean overall. We have a question from the live stream, and also a comment. Uh, Juana Harris asks, "We please encourage 
everyone or people to volunteer at the IBC, uh, an experience that she had and she enjoyed. And then she asks, did Kathy Thibodeau establish Ballet Magnificat? Yes. I'm intrigued by the earlier years and uh, some of the flapper dress and all <laughs> that, which seems to me from your presentation that she wasn't as much in the bohemian flapper tradition, but please can you expand a little bit on that period? What would you say? Um, I don't, it, that's a little hard to say. I will say, and Carolyn, we know this, not only from uh, oral history, but we know it from photographs that we went yeah, through. Yeah, and that's what I was going to say. There's so uh, many more photographs yeah. in uh, the book that Arthur I couldn't share. and Thalia entertained regularly in their village apartment. And if you could see some of those photographs, I mean, nothing wrong with them, but people sitting around playing guitar and people yeah, dancing. Yeah, having parties. And having parties and a lot of that. Uh, that period. was another side we wanted to show of her. And, you know, due to time, there were things we had to cut. But you would love some of the images in the book that do speak to that. And a lot of those people would go on to be famous. I mean, Thalia uh, helped Gene Kelly do his, some of his work to get ready for his first movie audition. Yeah. And, uh, famous guitarists and other musicians who were in the village in those in those time period, and they would all know each other. But yes, yeah. there's some of that. I don't know if that's an answer to your question, but there's some of that. Chris, over there. Mm -hmm. uh, this was uh, more of a comment. Uh, about a year ago, I was talking to a friend of mine who was the driver for the Chinese dancer that. Uh, immigrated. So I decided to do some research and maybe write something about it. Uh, apparently he doesn't use the term defect uh, because he didn't have to apply for asylum. Uh, uh, he just went to New Orleans and asked to immigrate without uh, having to. But he is alive and teaching and Yes, he is. Uh, Thank you for well. that. Yeah, you know, you don't follow every trail because it's not part of her story, but it's interesting what, to know the just, end. Because uh, I mean, I, I, would, I was a Millsap student when that happened, and it was a big deal. Right. Uh, uh, everybody made jokes about it. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Actually, I have a question for Representative Bowen. I was hoping you would be here. Do you know who the unidentified <laughs> state representative is in that photo? And I want to tell you, we, I went to MDAH, the research librarian, and put them on it, and nobody came back with an answer for me. I mean, I don't want you to think I left that like that. That was on my mind till publication day. <laughs> but no help. Might be one, it might be one of the commissioners. Oh, the PowerPoint's too. down. She was asking uh, on a photo ID. Let's see if I can. Well, I we've got the projector off. I'm not sure if we can. I don't think it's not coming Do back a, on. Is it in the book? Yeah. We'll do some real time research. Yeah. That's funny. I did really look for that for some time. I didn't like leaving his name. Okay. It's this guy. Do you know Susan? Anybody else have a question while he's studying on that? <laughs> he's being put to the You're test. Right. I'm fascinated, although we here in Mississippi knew Thalia Mara as an, a single woman who just transformed the arts in Mississippi. I am fascinated by her partnership with Mr. Mahoney. I mean, they were partners professionally I think you said for 10 years before they, they married. married. And then at age 65, she leaves to come to Jackson. Had she separated from him and was looking for a new place? Well, they had separated earlier. They or, did, or they the did found, found the National Academy of Ballet together. Uh, he left shortly after for professional opportunities out west. So they lived apart. Do you want to add anything to that? Then they would get back together later in life, though. He would come to Jackson periodically and then ultimately 
back to her home until yeah his death. And he, yeah, he will die here. He died here in Jackson. Yeah. Yeah. On North Side. E on East North Side Drive. Right before the split. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? Any other questions? We have copies of the book for sale over here. It is beautiful and fabulous, and you should certainly come take a look at it. And if you have any other questions or comments for our duo, they'll be glad to talk to you while you're in line here. Thank you all for being here. I hope that you come back you. for the events that we have upcoming, uh, not least of which is next Wednesday's History is Lunch with the Evers family and the Evers scholars. For now, help me thank Carla Wall, Carolyn Brown, for this program today.